Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Phase World Podcast, episode number 14. Yesterday was a really big day for me. Phase World Podcast hit a thousand download milestone. I decided to post a message on Facebook thanking all my guests and the people who inspired and encouraged me to pursue this project in the first place. I also welcomed the first snow day in Boston in 2015. Anyway, it is with great, great pleasure for me to introduce my guest to you today. His name is Ralph Peterson Jr. Ralph is a renowned American jazz musician and a full-time professor at the Berklee School of Music. I met Ralph at our Taekwondo school in 2005. Both of us still practice regularly at O'Malley Taekwondo Center in Peabody, Massachusetts. Ralph often volunteers his time to teach drumming to children during summer and winter camps at the Taekwondo school. All the kids simply love him so, so much. I remember seeing their little faces pressed up against the school's window waiting for Ralph to arrive with his truck full of drum sets and equipment. Ralph believes that it is his responsibility to pass his knowledge to the next generation. Passing down his knowledge is the way for him to preserve the traditions that he loves. Ralph says, in order to keep a gift, you have to be willing to give it away. Before Ralph's appointment at Berkeley, He has taught at the Juilliard School, Princeton University, Long Island University, and the Manhattan School of Music. In this two-part interview with Ralph, we cover topics from his experience performing with Brian Lynch at the Sochi Olympics to his point of view on Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000-hour rule as evidence of extraordinary achievement, particularly in music to the most common questions that students have asked Ralph and the most uncommon questions that haven't been asked enough. Ralph not only speaks to the teaching, but also the learning of music. In order to study other musicians, Ralph says, you have to think farther than one generation to really get inside their brains and understand where they are coming from. Speaking from experience, Ralph has apprenticed under some of the greatest jazz musicians of our time, including Art Blakey, Betty Carter, Elvin Jones, and Walter Davis. Some of my favorite topics with Ralph include that today students are simultaneously equipped with the most resources, but also the biggest liabilities. Ralph speaks to a time where cassette tapes were considered advanced technology. So admittedly, pursuing a career in music is almost never easy. In search of a shared voice among musicians for their inspirations and also struggles, in part two of our conversation, Ralph opened up about how he freed himself from an addiction to crack cocaine. Ralph has been drug-free for over 19 years. There are many takeaways from musicians and non-musicians in this interview, in my opinion. Ralph's belief as a music teacher and student is that you have to identify your gift your bliss, and start to build a career on top of them. As time changes, you have to adapt and learn how to keep your knowledge and skills current. Ralph was able to redefine his brand and what success means to him as he continues to grow and learn from this experience. Without further ado, please welcome Ralph Peterson Jr. Thanks for joining. Well, yeah, Um, I think somehow all this is connected as you're talking about the past versus the present. You know, I was, I always contemplated, um, you know, how has that impacted music? And, you know, growing up, I saw your bio that you started playing and performing at the age of three. Well, yeah, I started playing drums when I was three years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
There's a great picture I want to show you while I talk while I while we uh, talk about it. My father was a drummer, mm -hmm. and my uh, one of my uncles was drummer, and uh, my grandfather played cymbals in the church. So that's like three generations mm -hmm. of drummers in your in my family, and I'll show you the cymbals. See those cymbals over there on mm -hmm. the ledge? Yeah. Those cymbals belong to my grandfather, Whoa. and those, you know, so they're they're well over a hundred years old and I played the he played those in the church mm. you know uh, just cymbals not drum set not just cymbals and so uh, it uh, has been a part of my kind of DNA structure mm -hmm. to be around or playing or near the drums in one way shape or form they've always been in my house and they've always been downstairs so mm -hmm. so for me to have this kind of house now as an adult with drums in the basement mm -hmm. or in the lower level is almost uh you know natural mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't feel right if they were upstairs somewhere in one of the bedrooms up there mm -hmm. yeah but i'll hunt around and i'll show you this picture you'll, you'll know when i find it but yeah, yeah yeah come from a long line of drummers and and from a region of New Jersey that produce great drummers as well. Mm -hmm. Southern New Jersey, Atlantic City, Atlantic City mm -hmm. area. I'm from Pleasantville, New Jersey, which is five to seven miles mm -hmm. west of Atlantic City. Um, That's interesting. It's like yeah, part of this regional, and that makes sense, right? I, yeah, a lot of great drummers. Harvey Mason, who played with on Herbie Hancock's. Mm -hmm. Uh, famous chameleon record um, Peter Erskine who played with weather report mm -hmm. you know they all we all come from a kind of Ventnor Atlantic City Pleasantville is like a 10 mile triangle wow. of each other you know those guys were a little they're a little bit my senior but we come from the same place no doubt mm -hmm. no doubt yeah I think your career has taken you to many very interesting places and um, do you mind reminding me? It was a it was a very recent event. I think it was at the Olympics. Yes, I was fortunate enough to travel to and perform at Sochi Olympics mm -hmm. with a great trumpeter Brian Lynch, mm -hmm. as a part of a cultural exchange between his instrument company. Here's mm -hmm. a picture from that. Here's some pictures from that actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's on a sound check, you know. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's me in a Russian hat, <laughs> right? And and the, the audience, and, and this was in a park at a bear, mm -hmm. and this was the view outside of my window mm. of, of my hotel room. And it was right on the Black Sea. It was really great. Um, you know, music does that. It has, the, it, it has the ability to take you all over the world. That's where it all began, though. Oh, that's right. where it all began. I uh, I, need a, <laughs> I need a picture of that. You want picture. that? Okay, baby, okay, I'll send it to you. I'll send baby it to Ralph. You. Absolutely. Yeah, great. You know, you. it's funny, as I was driving to your house today, I realized I've never, uh, I still haven't been to this area. Now I've lived in Massachusetts for a new You've never been to the South Shore? Uh, well, South Shore, yes, but particularly uh, Weymouth. Weymouth, no. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's nice over here. It, very nice. I, I like it, and it's... Um, Close to Braintree and, and Quincy. Yeah, and yeah. I've been to those places multiple times. Ah, but you never yeah. came over to Weymouth. Yeah. Yeah, we have the docks over here. It's nice yeah. and and uh, you know it's a it's a it's a pit bull friendly municipality, which was important for us because uh, Bohana is the, is the second pit bull that we've had since. You know, my wife and I have been together. We had to put down our 14-year-old pit, Aww. Kira, mm -hmm. in, in July of this year. So uh, that was tough. But, you know, it's a, it, it has great, uh, great parks and, yeah, friendly yeah. people. And it's right next to Route 3, which gets me on the 93, mm -hmm. or I can take the train. The red line's Berkeley. not too far. I can get right into Boston nice. for or to the airport fairly easily. So that's yeah. always a big factor for me. Yeah. I got to be within an hour of a major airport. Mm -hmm. Or it's just, it becomes not cost effective for me because yeah. if, if it costs me $200 to get to the airport, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
then, you know, the job really has to be paying a lot of money for it to be worth my while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting. I I was going to say that, you know, as a musician, you know, at your caliber versus (laughs) as a podcaster at my level, surprisingly, even podcasting. I'm not sure what that means, but (laughs) I'm not sure what that means. But I mean, level, you know, I look at I look at levels linearly. Mm. Um, And so we all are kind of on a similar journey on the same journey, Mm -hmm. whether it's with our careers or Mm -hmm. with our training in martial arts, you know, Mm -hmm. um, some of us may be further down the line, but we're all on the same line. I like that. You answer. know, and and uh, it's more a question of experience than it is a person being better than mm-hmm. another person. I tell my students all the time mm-hmm. when I show them something new and they stumble with it, mm-hmm. I say, "Look, this don't get frustrated. This is not beyond your ability." Mm-hmm. It's difficult for you because it's just beyond your experience. Mm-hmm. So this, it's it's not that you're incapable. You just have to experience it more, mm-hmm. which is another way of telling them, go practice. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> because <laughs> practice is how you experience, mm-hmm. you know, the thing that's difficult, the thing that challenges you. Mm-hmm. you know, so. Speaking of practice, you know, uh, have you read the book is um, by uh, I think it's called The Outlier by Malcolm Gladwell. One chapter that's really known is called the Ten Thousand Hours, specifically towards like musicians. Well, what's your take on that? About ten thousand hours of like I have mastery. not I have not read that book, mm-hmm. and I probably like many musicians with the gift of music love playing music and working on music so much that we're not I I wouldn't I couldn't tell you how to how long 10,000 hours feels like Mm. because music is the one thing that I lose time and space doing Mm. you know I, I you know my sense of time goes away my sense of pain goes away I can be injured I had to play a show I'm coming off of a a shoulder pull, mm-hmm. uh, which basically I got from lifting luggage uh-huh. on the train while on the road. But I had to play a show. And I took a couple of days off of training at the Dojang because I wanted to rest the shoulder. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, the whole show I'm thinking, boy, everybody's going to be really disappointed in me because mm-hmm. I can't be playing well. Mm-hmm. You know, because I'm worried about... And that was right up until the time the music started. Yeah. Mm. And as soon as the music stopped, I began worrying about it again. (laughs) But while the music was going, Mm. there's absolutely no pain. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think Deepak Chopra said, once you you discover the thing Mm. that you lose time and space doing, Mm. that that's a a part of your bliss. Mm. And that, you know, when you find your bliss, you find your purpose, Mm. you know. And so for me, playing music, teaching music, doing martial arts, teaching martial arts, Mm -hmm. they're my bliss, Mm. you know, my personal bliss. Not, you know, family, you know, the time I spend with my wife and family goes without saying. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, family's important. My father passed away in June. And so I'm really getting the sense, a new sense of experience Mm -hmm. of what it's like to be, you know, the man in my arm of the family tree Mm -hmm. and how important it is with that. Um, And learning how to live without my father is a reference point all the time Mm -hmm. you know i didn't realize how many things (laughs) i used to bounce off of him until he was gone Mm -hmm. sometimes insignificant stuff like i watched the manny pike manny pacquiao fight this morning Mm -hmm. on replay on hbo and that was a convert that was a talk we would always have Mm -hmm. because my father was a champion amateur boxer Mm -hmm. so we would always talk about the fight game you know together so you know, I'm really, I feel fortunate in life to have 
found these things and been able to sustain myself Mm -hmm. doing these things because people go through whole lifetimes without that without 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 finding that you know and so uh, i'm really blessed i think music is your superpower i've seen it in many (laughs) forms right I, I, this is the question I'm, I was desperate to ask, and as you have seen, I've scribbled on my paper. But sometimes we quickly go go to different tracks and more interesting discoveries. And one of the questions I wrote down about an hour ago before I started driving was, "Is it true, as a non musician myself? I mean, I, I'll tell you about my musical background. Perhaps you'll be impressed about two percent. But um, you know, as a non musician, I we question what is it like to think." To, to sleep, to, to dream like a musician. And how does your world and your experience, sort of experience change around it? How does it change your senses? You know, is it your sixth or a seventh sense? You know? Well, you know, I kind of think that if you remove the specific language and, and peculiarities of music, I could ask you the same question about whatever it is that you do. Yeah. What you do for a living, uh-huh. you know, which is what gra- project manager is what I do full time. But deep down, I consider myself a, an artist. Right, so and I, so I, as I, an <laughs> artist, you're you're a mar- you're an artist on multiple levels. Yeah, you're you're a martial artist. artist. You're a language mm-hmm. artist. You mm-hmm. teach you teach language arts. You you know so um, music is just my the particular dialect. Mm-hmm that the creator endowed me with the ability to understand <laughs> and and develop. Um, you know, I don't want to get into a religious discussion on a Sunday afternoon, but <laughs> some of this stuff, you, know, you called it, you, you said music is my superpower. Mm-hmm. That's another way of saying it, that, mm-hmm. that it is a, that is a gift beyond my doing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yes, I practice, you know, probably not as much as I should anymore. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. um, but it's an enjoyment. It's, it's an choice. enjoyment when I'm teaching all the time. It's like practicing. Yeah, but it never takes the place of practicing. So, you know, the big gaps that we get off at Berkeley, mm-hmm. I spend a lot of that time working on stuff. Mm-hmm. Work, work, working on my piano skills. Working on my writing. Mm-hmm. Practicing trumpet. You know, because mm-hmm. I play trumpet too as well as drums. Mm-hmm. So. <clears throat> I don't know that it feels any different from you being in your bliss Mm -hmm. or the actor being in theirs or the the guy who can frame a house Mm -hmm. because to me like i have a i have my one of my son-in-laws is a contractor and the way this kid shoots up ladders and climbs across spaces not even roofs but spaces where roofs are going to go right i mean to me that's a superpower mm, it is and i find it as fascinating as anybody who might watch me play drums mm-hmm. who have never seen that might mm-hmm. have the same reaction um mm-hmm. you know christopher is an amazing builder of stuff mm-hmm. You know, and I I broke my wrist flying a kite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, power tools are supposed to be kept far away (laughs) from people like me. This is this is so fascinating. And um, I uh, I feel like your perception to the world, not not just that I started learning today, but I've noticed since our friendship um, began years and years ago Mm -hmm. uh, as Taekwondo practitioners. And um, uh, it's so interesting. I I kept recalling this moment when you and I had to practice a form together. I think the form at the time was new to both of us. So we kept falling out of sync. And then then I realized, and I found out, that moment I found out you're a drummer. I was thinking, I should probably follow your tempo (laughs) more so than my own. (laughs) Well, you know, you learn as you continue training to bring whatever asset you have to the training mm. where if your asset is 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 based in memorization or it's based in analyzation or whether it's based in tempo or timing mm-hmm. you know um i'm working on it i'm still working on it <laughs> but i've always been since i've been training again one of the largest if not the biggest guys 
<laughs> trading. So I've always struggled with trying to move with people who are smaller than me. Mm -hmm. And not f because in my mind, I always feel like I'm moving in slow motion. <laughs> okay. Know. You know, because, you know, you're all small and fit and, you know, size nothing. And, you know, my belt could probably wrap around you four times before it could make a knot. But what I had to learn was that the answer wasn't to speed up, but mm -hmm. to actually slow down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And to find the unique gift mm -hmm. in being a martial artist of my age mm -hmm. and my physical type. Mm -hmm. And that advantage is not speed, mm -hmm. it's power. Mm -hmm. And so I started working on learning how to generate a lot of power in, mm -hmm. in not knockdown power, but discernible, visible, audible power mm -hmm. in the art of doing forms, which mm -hmm. is, you know, my fighting days are over. I got a metal plate and eight screws in my right ankle. Mm -hmm. I got four screws and two rods and a rebuilt disc in my back. Mm -hmm. Spinal fusion. You know, my fighting days are over. Mm -hmm. But as a martial artist um, and as a kind of student of history mm -hmm. and all things traditional, which kind of jazz musicians are at heart, mm -hmm. it's no it's no wonder why my focus is is on forms mm -hmm. and and the way forms are executed. So yeah, you know we've come a long way together in that realm. Yeah. So it's great that we can do this now and talk. Yeah, we haven't had this opportunity to yeah. sit down, and I think one of the moments uh, I think it's a treasure for me to reflect upon is the people I've interviewed. I typically have known them mm -hmm. for years and years. We've mm -hmm. never had this moment to sit down for 45 minutes for an hour. Um, and, you know, one of the, I have a list of questions to go through. <laughs> so I've always been fascinated by jazz music for two reasons. Uh -huh. So um, in my previous episode, I had mentioned that uh, my mom's side of the family and my dad's side combined, we have almost divided in the middle. Half of them are musicians, half of them are artists. You probably didn't know this. I didn't know that, right? <laughs> so it's just great getting information about you too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and um, so my parents probably, for, for one reason or the other, I think just to be there trying to be rebels and plus I didn't have a strong interest in say the piano, which mm. every child plays growing up in China. Mm, mm, my mm. parents wanted the opposite for me, so I didn't end up doing that. What I did find myself is choosing to study saxophone when I was in a private high school up in Freiburg, Maine. Okay. And uh, I was asked to uh, by uh, my music teacher to be able to choose an instrument. So I screamed out uh, alto saxophone because okay. the word in my mind uh, that appeared was very sexy. Something about <laughs> saxophone I was just very romantic, okay. Okay. very sexy, okay. and uh, very inaccessible. Mm. Not accessible at all in China, right? Mm. So mm. I started playing, and fast forward, and I think I did okay in concert band. I loved, I loved practicing. I loved performing with my peers. But there's one, I remember there was a jazz band, and Freiburg Academy is actually very famous, very known for that. Okay. And we actually competed at Berkeley, and the they won. Okay, cool. Not, not, not to go um, too deep into that. Do you still have your saxophone? I do. Ah, uh, yeah, this I think. Is the <laughs> this is the question. Yeah, it's I don't, never too things. late. I like that, and um, you know, I I remember feeling very jealous about the jazz band we had, and it was the the brightest of. You know, the people from the concert band. The concert band is, say, like 40, 50 people, whereas the jazz band was six to eight to no more than 10 people. Yeah, it, yeah. you know, the jazz the jazz groups, because they're smaller, yeah. are naturally more competitive. And so they're... Way more. So, well, <laughs> only they're perceived as being at a higher level, but maybe they are, maybe they're just perceived that way. Mm. Um I think that the difficulty of learning the vocabulary and language of jazz music mm. in order to move it forward, I think the I think it's the most difficult music 
to play. I, I agree. If I may comment on that real quick while <laughs> studying you through articles, bios, and I almost hit a wall. I was like, let me not even try to say all the parts and the elements. And well, the yeah. Things. I mean, we could do a podcast. We could, we could do a podcast together okay. analyzing one piece of music, <laughs> and it could go in six parts because, <laughs> you know, I, I hear music that way. Mm -hmm. You know, people who don't know painting art look at the pretty colors. That's it. They don't see the shading and the dynamic and the contrast and the negative the mm -hmm. negative space and the you yeah. you know stuff yeah. stuff that, that that you know um people with a learned eye mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can see. And so um yeah I studied at uh I went to Pleasantville High School in Pleasantville, New Jersey, and I studied uh, music with a couple of band directors uh, that were important to mention mm -hmm. for both positive and negative reasons. Uh, Rob, Rob Reiner, mm -hmm. um, Jack Melton, uh, Bill Woods. But, but the standout was my choir director, mm -hmm. Dr. Ola H. Gathers. And because she... Uh, number one was tasked with um, the director of all arts programs at the high school. Mm -hmm. But she also took over probably the most accomplished element of our high school music programs, which was our choir. Mm -hmm. And so I sang in the choir under Dr. Gathers, but I also learned my first music theory lessons were with her. Mm. And those music theory lessons, you know, allowed me to basically test out mm. of a lot of the high school, a lot of the collegiate prerequisites. And so uh, I went to Rutgers University, class of 84, right? I graduated high school in 80. I graduated from Rutgers in 84. And at Rutgers, I studied with another you know, studying jazz in the 80s was an incredibly unique time. I think the only thing, the only time that's equaled that period mm -hmm. is the period we're in now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, because like the period that I grew up in in college, the period now has... Institutions are filled with doers mm -hmm. as well, people who both do and teach. Mm -hmm. um, from Branford Marcellus to uh, former students of mine like Sean Jones, who's now the chair of the brass department at Berkeley, mm -hmm. uh, Terry Lynn Carrington, you know, mm -hmm. just won her second Grammy Award. She was hired at Berkeley two years after me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the economics of being a jazz musician now compels us. Mm, I like that. For, well, I mean, because the reality is when you're 20-something mm. and you got no kids and you can live in an apartment the size of the bathroom you were in earlier <laughs> and live on ramen noodles and brown rice because, you know, you, you, can, right? you, you can do that. But then you fall in love and then maybe a child comes your way yeah. and you have to start looking at life differently. And, mm. uh, you know, ultimately, by the time you meet, reach your mid-30s, mm. you, if you've been lucky and you've played a lot of places like I have, you begin to look for more mm. out of life than just the same. And don't get me wrong, the people who do that year in and year out, mm. more power to them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after a while, I began to feel like I was on a hamster wheel, and that feeling turned self destructive. Mm -hmm. for me and this is maybe a part of the podcast that you didn't think I was going to talk about No, I but you know I, I struggled with addiction for a while mm -hmm. you know I mean I was a cocaine addict I was a crack addict you know mm -hmm. and um, 
it wasn't because of one particular thing or another. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the most important thing was that once I was in, I couldn't get out under my own power, mm-hmm. right? So I got some help, and I continued to work on that. And now I'm, you know, coming up on 19 years drinking drug-free, and I help a lot of people mm-hmm. find a path and stay mm-hmm. on the path, and that helps keep me on the path. Mm-hmm. But having said all of that, that experience also clarified my priorities mm-hmm. and what was important. You know, um, I have a 25-year-old daughter who's the principal flautist with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. You know, I'm incredibly proud of her. She's got a great career. She's got a great profession. Um, And, you know, our relationship is not atypical of that. Of I remember when I was 24, 25 years old, I didn't have a lot to say to my parents. <laughs> that part. Yeah. You know, but that, that, that is what it is. But, um, uh, you know, as I got older, I also realized that a lot of the people <clears throat> who I had been fortunate enough in college and on the road mm-hmm. early in my career, that I was fortunate enough to learn directly from them were were leaving this earthly plane. Mm -hmm. They were dying. Mm -hmm. And with their deaths, there was either the void or the responsibility, the recognition that I was responsible for trying to fill that void for the generations behind me who want to learn how to play music and feel the superpower. You know what I mean? And so Mm -hmm. teaching... You know, when I started to look at, at becoming in earnest, being a, 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 a college professor, what I realized is that I had always wanted to teach. Mm-hmm. But, and this is an interesting societal topic, my parents being firmly entrenched in the black middle class, my father was a 35-year veteran of the police force and four-term mayor of the city I grew up in. My mother basically program mainframes mm-hmm. for the FAA, for air traffic control. Wow, I have no idea. That's, that's, so, like, these, you know, these are two, like, really heavyweight people and people who uh, whose careers were always on the rise, even until they retired. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, I, had a bi- I had a physics teacher that talked about the three levels of society, you know, and uh, he talked about doctors and lawyers and Mm. politicians being on the highest, and then, you know, you had your policemen and teachers and, you know, civil servants, postmen, and and then on the low, on the lowest end, you had, you know, your musicians and your artists. Artists. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, I remember being really disturbed by that. I remember being so disturbed by it that I went to Dr. Gathers and told her. Mm -hmm. And from that point in class, she told me, you make A's in this class, Mm -hmm. and I'll get you out of that class anytime you need to. Mm -hmm. So all I had to do was be good at the work. Mm -hmm. And when I was tired of hearing him talk that kind of shit, (laughs) (laughs) I could, could, you know, I could go and practice Mm -hmm. or go and have a jam session. I think... You know, it, you know. Sorry to. That's right. That's um, right. You've gone to this. Uh, what I think is really the sweet spot, um, and uh, I know you didn't cheat off uh, my plan. No, here, no, no. I can't. Even, I can't even understand it. It's in your handwriting, I'd have to like pick it up and stare at it. Yeah. yeah. What I think one of the teaching, uh, you know, as uh, and also being an educator, this is the area of the fostering an environment and a mentality to serve musicians, especially young musicians. And I, I would love to really get into that because I'm lucky enough to have, you know, come from a pretty musical uh, family. Mm-hmm. I have had friends from Freiburg Academy who uh-huh. graduated with scholarships to Berkeley. Uh-huh. And um, one of them, I remember he was um, in working in construction for some time and the other the other one, there's one graduate from McGill, is still touring to this day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I remember uh, um, 
Ming and this uh, this very talented young uh, woman who's now back in her home country in Amsterdam uh-huh. and um, performing, and then they all share their struggles with me. So I think to myself that there must be a shared voice somewhere, and with your experience, you know, to basically to what you just talked about. That is a struggle. Well, there's a principle I learned, you know. Uh, uh, um, I, and my interpersonal work in discover in recovery, mm-hmm. right? That in order to keep a gift, you got to be willing to give it away. Mm-hmm. We keep what we have by giving it away. That and and Art Art Blakey, one of my uh, great musical mentors, used to say in a more cryptic way: "You never see an armored car mm-hmm. following a hearst," <laughs> meaning if it's Financial riches, no matter how much you gather, you can't take none of it to the graveyard with you. Um, and I think learning through my experience that true riches, that my true wealth is the experience that I have. Mm-hmm. Good, bad, indifferent. Mm-hmm. And my willingness to share it uh, with folks who care enough either about what what we do in common or how I do it specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost an obligation. It's a responsibility from having received a gift in the first place. Mm-hmm. Because what good is it for me to have learned all that I've learned from my Blakey as a drummer and being chosen like I was chosen to be, you know, the last guy that this great drumming icon chose to sit on the bandstand and play drums with him. Mm -hmm. What good is it if I take all of that experience Mm -hmm. and guard it and protect it Mm -hmm. until the day I die? Mm -hmm. I've only saved it a generation at that Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But if I turn and and share it with players that are younger than me, then hopefully they'll reach a point where they recognize their responsibility of turning and sharing it with someone younger than them. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, teaching becomes an awesome responsibility in the preservation of the thing we say we love. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, playing music is a way to preserve the music. You make records, records are documents, they can last as long as, you know, the media that plays them lasts. But when you pass information from generation to generation, that's the living legacy mm-hmm. of an art form, whether it's of any art form, whether it's painting, like what your mom does, or martial arts, like when we're training Taekwondo, or whether it's music. it's the passing of the information becomes the way we protect what we love. Mm-hmm. You know, what, so... What are some of the questions? Now you teach at Berkeley, and I think we all know about Berkeley, right? Yeah, we, uh, we, I teach at Berkeley, but before I came to Berkeley, uh-huh. I taught at Juilliard and Rutgers and Princeton and Long Island University and Manhattan School of Music. No idea. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've taught... I've. And and those five schools, I was all teaching at at the same time. Mm, wow. uh, and when I came to Berkeley, it was an opportunity for me to kind of consolidate my teaching into one full-time commitment in one place. Because I was spending more time driving to those places yeah. than I was actually teaching when I got yeah. there, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. So yeah. the students are there. For yeah, them. yeah. I'm curious to find out what are some of the most common questions that you, your students would ask you in related to career? And the reason I think what we just talked about made a lot of sense for me to kind of encapsulate that. And and also, I suspect that people who are listening to this podcast, who are as seasoned as you are, experienced as you are, they're also going to be young musicians who are really curious to kind of see ahead of themselves. So what are some of the common questions? Well, without specifics, Mm -hmm. Most young musicians are more concerned with being as popular 
as the people that they find most popular. <laughs> okay? And part of my job is to snatch the veil of ignorance off of that mm -hmm. so that they realize that, the first of all, the most popular aren't not even sometimes in the top three of who the best really are at what they do. So true. Across industry, that the politics so. of the business and the art of playing music mm -hmm. are two completely different endeavors. Um, and so once we get that construct separated, then we can we can begin to attack each appropriately um, because you have a lot of players that come in and uh, only understand and this, but it's a natural thing for for young players to come in and know well the music of the people that are closest to their age mm -hmm. that's what they know that's, that's what, what they know you know, like a lot of my students know, you know, Robert Glasper and 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 uh, Ambrose Akimizuri and uh, uh, another young player, Walter Smith and these guys. Now, some of those, all of those guys, I know where all of those guys that I just named, mm -hmm. I know where all of them studied. And I know who they studied from, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things I try to point out to my students is when you're checking out a guy, be sure to check out who he checked out. Mm -hmm. Because the learning thing is just like the teaching thing. You have to go back farther than the immediate. You got to think farther than one generation. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if I want to understand why... Ralph Peterson plays drums the way he does, then what you want to do is get inside of Ralph Peterson's head, get him to talk about his experiences, and find out who he listened to. Mm -hmm. Listens to this podcast. You'll find all the answers. Yeah, I mean, I talk to, you know, I talk all the time about the drummers that influenced me. The famous ones like Philly Joe Jones, who played with Miles Davis, and, and Art Blakey, and the Jazz Messengers, and of course, Max Roach and Elvin Jones and Tony Williams. But then I talk about the lesser known drummers mm -hmm. like uh, Red Walcott mm -hmm. and, and uh, 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 man, <laughs> you know, you guys who, who Al Harewood, guys who are not household names, mm -hmm. but are important players in the continuum, that line that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. that uh, that linear uh positioning uh, of the of the of the history of the music and so once you understand that then you can under you you can have a better sense of what the possibilities are going forward mm -hmm. if you don't have a, an awareness of that you can bump into some stuff by accident mm -hmm. And you might even become popular. But what I try to prepare students to do is sustain a 30-year career. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's easy to make one record. Every musician in their life playing a, an instrument, <laughs> if given enough time, mm -hmm. money, and studio resources, can make one record. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the next record I put out as a leader will be my 19th as a leader. I've been on over 150 as a sideman. But put out 10 records and have them all keep you current, keep you relevant, you know. Mm -hmm. The nature of the business is 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 a young person's business, and I don't regret that it I don't resent that at 52. It's a reality. Mm -hmm. But, you know, never underestimate the treachery of old age. <laughs> I always I tell no, my no, students that. No, not old. Yeah. Not old. And, and you're getting into a, a, really a, the, my follow-up question, which is what are some of the questions that you feel like your students haven't 
have not asked you enough than you wish they did. In other words, I feel like there is some hidden gem somewhere of counterintuitive perspectives that you could offer to them. Well, the, the question that I welcome most and hear least <laughs> is... Um, What record is that on, and where can I go get it? Mm -hmm. Followed by the following week of, I got the record, and I'm hearing a lot of it, but this tune, I can't understand what's going on there. And that tune, I can't, I'm not quite sure. So the, the questions are general, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of a seeking, there's a certain kind of seeking spirit that I look for mm -hmm. in a student. Um, <clears throat> students today, have uh, simultaneously the most resources, mm -hmm. which is a, which is simultaneously their biggest liability. Yeah, I agree. For in other words, this this disc, this you know WD disc is what well, maybe a hundred gigabytes. A thousand gigabytes? Roughly. Maybe this is maybe this is this is in WD, so this is an older one. So this is maybe a hundred gigs, mm -hmm. right? And that's about the size of that's small as a cell phone, right? When I was coming up in college, we used to have to carry LPs around, <laughs> right? And and you know, uh, and and the advanced technology was cassette tapes, mm -hmm. so we didn't have iTunes. We didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. And I'm not belly aching. I'm almost grateful mm -hmm. because there are people who have heard and who possess more music than I do. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not a record collector. Mm -hmm. I'm a student of music. Mm -hmm. So I may not have all the records, mm -hmm. but the records I know, I know better than most people. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I've had this, you know, I have this kind of conversation almost every semester with students who walk around with these um, terabyte hard drives, 10 terabytes, right? Mm -hmm. I say, how many tunes you got on that thing? Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, I got, you know, I stick their chest out. I got 80,000 songs on it. Mm -hmm. I say, oh, yeah, how many solos can you sing? Mm -hmm. Not play, just sing, mm -hmm. you know, from that. And they're like, what do you mean? Why I got to sing the solos? Mm -hmm. I said, because singing the solos is learning the vocabulary. And why does a drummer have to learn how to sing a saxophone solo? So that he knows how to ornament a saxophone solo. Right? If you if you only think like drummers and you only listen to drummers, then you're only going to sound like a drummer. And I think that one of the reasons I've been able to stay relevant is that I play music on the drums, that, that what I play, that my approach, my concept towards drumming transcends solely drumming. Mm -hmm. And that's not an accident. That's something that has developed over time and with intent. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you have to, you have to um, identify what you after you find your bliss, you got to find your gift, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. and start to build your career on that. And then, as times change, you have to learn how to keep it relevant. Which is why you know we started out talking about the possibility of doing um, video podcasts or video lessons mm -hmm. from this music room, and how excited I am because that's going to help. Uh, redefine me as a brand onyx productions my record label i have mm -hmm. of the of the 18 records i've done as a leader four have been on my own label you know and so <clears throat> i'm constantly expanding and redefining who i am as an artist mm -hmm. and as a businessman and in, in in the in the attempt to stay relevant and stay fresh so that concluded part one of my interview with Ralph Peterson Jr. In part two, Ralph helps dissect the record business and how he succeeded by taking an alternative route. 
The process may seem counterintuitive at first before that you realize the option is actually quite obvious. Ralph also speaks to his addiction and how he freed his mind and body. Ralph has been drug-free for over 19 years. Hey, it's Faye. I am back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at faceworld.com, or social channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, also under Faceworld, to keep things simple. I personally review and respond to all the messages. Love to hear from you. Thank you, and lots of hugs. See you next week. <music>